Good morning, everyone. My name is Brenda Corona here from the Stakeholder Affairs Group, welcoming you to the Western Energy Imbalance Market Resource Efficiency Evaluation Enhancement Meeting. Today, May 3rd, 2022, we'll be discussing a meeting that will provide analysis reports on two topics. But before I begin showing you the agenda, I want to go over some housekeeping rules that would allow us to keep this meeting moving. This call is being recorded for informational convenience purpose only. Any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. Please encourage um, this meeting and structure to stimulate dialogue and engage different perspectives. So please keep comments professional, brief, and respectful when you're called on. And also, we will be making sure we're ch checking time. So if we do our coming up to a time where your comment is over, we will let you know, and we'll make sure to answer those questions. Um, the instructions to raise your hand using the virtual hand icon is located above the chat window on the very right corner. Use that in order to be entering the queue. If those who are entered in audio, please press pound two in order for our event producer to know that you're in audio only. Before speaking, please remember to state your name and affiliation so that way we know who's making the comment. And if you do experience any technical issues during the meeting, please send a chat to our rep producer or myself, and we'll make sure we answer any questions to those entered in the chat. For today's agenda, we will have Guillermo go over the interaction of hourly and time schedules for the WEIM transfers. And then next, we'll introduce Katie Williger for the inter high deviation adder. And then lastly, we'll wrap it up with the next step, and we'll see over a timeline. In this timeline that was presented here, I'm going to invite Guillermo to let me um, provide help, analysis, provide analysis on what's going on. But at this point, we're currently at the state quarter call, and then we're approaching another state quarter call later before June. And I would like to invite Guillermo to add any comment for this specific timeline and analysis effort. Guillermo? Thank you, Brenda. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the analysis that we are ready to present today. And uh, this is the original timeline that we discussed back in mid-February when we were ready to, to put this stage of analysis forward. And you may realize that there are a couple of variations to the timeline, but still the final deadline of putting all the analysis together is still holding for the end of May and we're still on target for that. Uh, today, we're going to present the two other topics that are within the scope of the analysis stage, and one is the interaction of inter schedules with uh, Western Energy Balance Market Transfers, and the second component is the analysis of the inter deviation other. And they are going to pile up to the analysis that we have done so far in the first round regarding the low conformity impact and also the quantile calculation for the uncertainty requirement. The expectation is that given the preliminary analysis that we have, given the feedback we are receiving through the process, we are expecting to have the full scope of the intended analysis posted by the end of May. What we are going to see today is still preliminary. It's not a complete uh, scope of what we have envisioned to have. But this is a good timing and a good opportunity to give you uh, a glance of how the analysis turned out for these specific areas. We still have a few items that we have in the scope, and expectedly we have this ready for the final uh, document by the end of May. Uh, today, this is going to be related to these two topics. Once we have this and we internalize the feedback that we have received and completed the pending items, we're expecting to have a, a final version of the three topics that would be the, the others, the uncertainty and intertide deviation, the impact of load conformance, and the interaction of um, our interties with the Western Energy Balance Market Transfers. And we expect to put this all together and then have one the session to go over the detailed analysis. Now, th there may be some complications time-wise because even though we expect to have this uh, report posted by the end of May, 
we have to figure out a, a good time to have the, the call given other initiatives and effort that the CAISO is undertaking. And that is right now the commitment that we have, and that is per schedule that we agree upon back in mid February. And uh, similar to the first round, we have posted uh, two reports, one for each of the two topics we're going to be discussing. The discussion today is capturing the essence of the scope of this preliminary analysis that we have. And we would appreciate any feedback that you may have uh, for this uh, second round of analysis so that potentially we can still have a couple of weeks to internalize any any other feedback that you may have at this stage. With that, I think we're ready to go into the specifics of the analysis. We can start, please, with the first topic. The the first topic is the early intertie interaction with wind transfers. And uh, there are several areas of analysis that we start looking at. And the preliminary findings that you can find can be summarized effectively in four or five items. Uh, we know, and we have been reporting that very consistently, that the wind transfers for KAISO, and in general across the IM are quite robust. We can see heavy volumes of exports and import transfers for the KAISO area. And obviously, and this is something that I have to emphasize, uh, the intent of this analysis was quite targeted at the KAISO interplay. It doesn't mean that we are ignoring completely what's happening in other areas, but given the, the discussion that has uh, arisen from the resource efficiency evaluation, the primary focus and the scope was in terms of what's going on with the KAISO. And obviously, the our intertire schedules is something that is specific to the KAISO area, and that is effectively uh, the reason why we are focusing specific to, to the KAISO area. The, the second finding that you can see through the different metrics is that we have, and I will elaborate more on details, but we have a sizable amount of exports coming into the market through the hourly transactions of interties. And the majority of those exports were basically real-time schedules. Uh, we have different sequences through the market where some exports uh, coming from the ahead market can come into the real-time market. There are those also that can economically be it, or they can just be price takers in the last minute real-time market. Once we realize of the volume of real-time exports, those that didn't have any position from the day ahead, you can see that the majority of those exports are self scales Effectively, they are willing to take any price. They are price takers, effectively, and they are going to be driving the full utilization of the available supply, not, not only for the KAISO, but across the uh, WIM. The, the other finding that we have is something that we, to some extent, discussed in previous rounds of the RSC initiative, and that is that each of the real-time sub-markets, HASP, FMM, RTD, clear a centralized market. And part of that is going to attain the specific wind transfers. Uh, it's quite consistent to see that, at least for the critical days of tight supply conditions, there is a portion of wind import transfers coming into the KAISO that are unrealized as we move across the market. We may have a specific volume clearing has that is advisory in nature for the transfers, and that comes to be lower when we realize into the RTD market, which are more operational binding transfers. And that unrealized capacity represents a challenge for the KISO because effectively when we were clearing exports, the advisory transfers were part of the equation to find out the perfect least cost uh, balance of supply and demand. Once we have unrealized portion of these transfers, now that balance is broken. And now the real time up to the KISO has to figure out how to, to preserve that balance once we have lost that part of the supply pool. And uh, that is uh, quite uh, revealing and is quite persistent in the critical tight supply days. And uh, that on its own is going to, to pose a challenge. And I think this is one of the specific areas of concerns that gave rise to this uh, need for analyzing 
how the interaction is happening between our linter ties and the WIM transfers. And I will elaborate more on each of these. That is the whole rest of the presentation. Uh, let's move on, please, and then into the next slide. Oh, I think we have one question. Can we open up the line for Michelle, please? Hey, Michelle, your line is unmuted. Hi, uh, this is Michelle Kida from the CPUC. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Hey, um, Guillermo, I was wondering if you guys also looked at the HASP imports that are supporting exports because, and then also looked at whether those HASP imports are showing up in um, our, the real time market because that could also be a problem because I believe um, there was some uh, indication that they weren't tagging and weren't showing up. And that would also require Kaiso to support those exports, right? Yeah, well, there are so many angles that we can analyze things on, Michelle. I don't know you have had an opportunity to see what we have put so far. There is some discussion about imports. Maybe at the end we can see if there is a still pending area that you feel that there is some more analysis to be done. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me go into the specific items of uh, this first component. And uh, this is a trend of the transfers. And uh, this is a monthly distribution of the transfers that are happening across the, uh, specific to the real time interval dispatch, the RTD market. The extremes tell us the minimum, the maximum, the positives are imports, negatives are export transfers into the Kaiso from the wind market. The blue dot um, somewhere in, inside the violin plot stands for the average value. And there is a line inside the violin plot. That line stands for one standard deviation of the transfers. And you can see it's, it's quite robust. You can see the highest, the lowest values. We are easily talking about 4,000, in some cases, 5,000 watts of uh, EIM transfer. That, that is a good signal of very robust uh, wind transfers specific to the kite. So, and obviously, if that transfer is happening in one direction, it has to be offset by the corresponding opposite direction of the transfer from going to other areas. And there are some trends here to highlight. Obviously, the volume is quite a, a fact on its own, but we can see the trend over time, for instance. Typically, you can see that we're going to have the highest volumes of export transfers, meaning CAISO is sending transfers out of its area because it has plenty of supply, and that is typically happening in the shoulder months, anywhere between February through May. You can see that the, the values are the lowest. And actually, they they have a, an increasing trend. They are lower and lower, meaning there are more and more uh, wind export transfers going out of the Kaiso system. And when we see the hourly profile, and we have many different ways to uh, slice and dice this information, typically it's in the midday hours, right? As early as our ending 12, 13, going to our ending 14, 16, when we still have robust supplies from and renewable penetration. And then we can see the highest values, and they tend to have also some trend here. We can see that the highest values happen right after the shorter months, and we turn into the summer conditions, and you can see that the highest values are going to be observed typically in the July, August time frame, such as those of July 2021, for instance, when we were reaching over 4,000 megawatts of, of transfers. That is just an illustration of how robust the EIM transfers are for, for the Kaiso area. And again, uh, any specific WIM transfer for the Kaiso is uh, compensated by a corresponding transfer going or coming from another set of areas. Next slide, please. Now, when we go across the markets, and we have, as indicated, and clearing transfers in each of the sub-markets in the hourly ahead scheduling process, the HASP, the 15-minute market, FMM, and the RTD market, that is the interval dispatch, five-minute dispatch market. And we see that when, when you look at this overall, that there seems to be a good correlation, right? And we expect that. Uh, Conditions change from market to market, and they are not going to be changing dramatically every single interval. 
and that is somehow expected given the conditions that the real-time market is dealing with in such a short time frame. There is so much change that may happen. That said, there are many other points that you can zoom in and realize that, yes, even though overall there is a good correlation, there are some cases in which the, the unrealized transfers are quite material, right? And you can start analyzing quadrant by quadrant of this plot. If you slice this in four segments, that, in four regions that will be defined by the zero axis in the y and x axis, and we refer, for instance, to the first quadrant, that would be the, the upper right corner. We can see, for instance, if you pick a value, let's say, for a has transfer of 3,000 megawatts, there are some dots there in which the corresponding R3 transfers can be affected zero. That means HASP was clearing at 3,000 megawatts of imports, and then the RTD happened to have zero transfer. So it represents an unrealized transfers between HASP and RTD of 3,000 megawatts. And that is the criticality. Once we lose that advisory transfer, uh, the consequences of losing that is not per se the transfer on its own, but the implications of what the transfer was supposed to be supporting by the time we clear the, the HASP market. This plot also color code the outs just to try to give a sense of uh, how that correlation holds across the different hours of the day. It's quite busy plot, but you can see that the purpose is standing for later hours in the day uh, are all over the place. But if you see the first quadrant below the line, uh, you can see that that represents typical late hours in the day in which HASP was clearing advisory transfers uh, that eventually in RTD came lower. And that is the, the challenge, that is the concern. The line here is uh, a simple interpolation that we have. And you can see how, how neat that uh, correlation shows to be between the HASP and RTD. We have other types of correlation shown in the report, uh, FMM versus HASP and RTD versus FMM. Next slide, please. Now, one approach we have taken for this is that we really want to zoom in, right? And that is the whole point of trying to do this specific analysis. We can see trends over time, averages and distributions are useful to see those trends. But we really want to go one step deeper and start analyzing effectively what's happening in certain hours in critical days, like those of the high supply conditions in July. And that is the reason we have taken the approach of analyzing a specific uh, subset of days. And the days that we selected here is basically uh, a week worth of data for each of the months, uh, just to represent the typical days of the month. Uh, we took, obviously, the week of July 9 and captured the essence of the tight supply conditions. We took another week for August and September when we observed high uh, load conditions, even though we may not be as critical as July. We wanted to see how that evolved over different time frames when we still have, relatively speaking, high loading conditions. This illustration has two components. The first one on the left is the, the trends of the different wind transfers specific to the Kaiser over the period of seven days. The other sets of days are available in the report. Here we just focus on one set. And we put, obviously, in July 9, the period to, to analyze further. And this just shows you the trends over time, over the hours of the day for the different transfers across the market, the HASP, the FMM, and the RTD. Uh, overall, you can see that they follow a general trend. They, they track relatively the same trend. But when it comes to, to critical hours, for instance, the peak hours, and more specifically, hour ending, let's say, 15 through 20 or so, when is the period of tightest uh, supply conditions, you can see that there is a very consistent trend, and that is the blue line that represents the RTD wind transfers happen to be lower than the other two, which are the FMM and the HAT, effectively meaning 
has an FMM were projecting to have certain level of transfers. When it comes to RTD, they happen to realize at lower values. Uh, this is a little bit busy because the lines overlap. So if you look at the right-hand side, the, there is a different way to, to see this, and it's exactly the same information. The right-hand side is the relative deltas, the delta from HASP to FMM, that is the first sequential market that we have, and then from FMM to RTD, that is the second sequential step that we have in the real-time market. Uh, and we typically refer to this as the buyback, right? You may have a position in HASP, and then the market, and based on the newest conditions that it has in a subsequent market, is going to come to a different value. If it is a generator that was dispatched in advisory nature at 100 megawatts and now in RTD is dispatched effectively to 70 megawatts, there is some type of buyback, right? We were expecting to, to, to buy 100 megawatts of energy in HASP at a certain price. Typically, it's going to be higher because the, the conditions are tighter for, for requiring more supply. When it comes to RTD, the resource is going to be actually dispatched at 70. And that is a buyback of 30 megawatts that you, you sell generation or supply at 100 for a higher price, and then you come in RTD and get dispatched to a lower value. You are buying back the delta, the 30 megawatts, at the real-time price. And these areas, the, the two steps from HASP to FMM and from FMM to RTD, um, quantifies that unrealized transfers that happen between these, among these three markets. And we we can see through the day, and obviously it's up and down depending on the time of the day, but the consistency here in the trend is that for the peak hour, the critical hours, out in 15, 15, all the way through 2021, 20, you can see that there is a dominant trend and that is a negative side, meaning the the buyback is there from the HASP to FMM and from FMM to RTD. And when you compare the two steps, the majority of that delta is effectively between FMM to RTD. That effectively means that the gray area, the lighter gray area, represents small changes from HASP to FMM. The significant changes happen from FMM to RTD. And uh, that the other trend that you can see here is that there is a black line overlapping in these areas. This black trend represents the net of the two deltas. In some cases, the movement from HASP to FMM may be an increasing movement that offsets a decreasing movement from FMM to RTD. So you want to see effectively the net movement, movement from HASP to RTD the black line is going to tell you effectively how much uh, buyback happened for the WIM transfers for KAISO. And uh, that highlights the, the original concern that was uh, widely discussed in the previous rounds of analysis about this interaction of uh, unrealized uh, EIM transfers from the advisory hat to the binding RTD. Next slide, please. What does this mean? I think it's quite intuitive to, to see the, the implication of this, but let me try to summarize this. Obviously, the, the transfers and the transfers on its own are not um, decision variables. We are not optimizing transfers per se. Right? The transfers are simply the byproduct of imbalances of supply across the balancing area. If we have an excess of supply in one area, like Kaiso in the middle of the day, that means that the balance for the Kaiso is going to be not uh, strictly holding, and we have a surplus, and that surplus is going to go to other areas, and that reflects effectively an export transfer from the Kaiso. And that is a byproduct, but it's a byproduct of the power, supply, demand, and balance that we have specific to each area. And as such, when the market is optimizing this through the centralized approach, the least cost dispatch, uh, these imbalances of supply are going to be optimally attained. Uh, and uh, effectively, any other variable that is at play in the market is going to influence the, the determination of the final values of the transfers. That means any supply that is available not only for the KISO but across the system 
could play a factor in the determination of the final values of the EIM transfers, because what we are doing is including an overall system-wide uh, list cost dispatch. Now, there are certain time frames from the HASP to FMM to RTD that inherently poses a challenge that conditions are going to be changing, right? Uh, the HASP market is running as early as 75 minutes in advance versus seven and a half minutes of RTD, and that is at least 70 minutes uh, lag time where things may change, and that could explain to some extent the variation of the wind transfers. There are other factors like the conformance that we uh, discussed in the previous round of the analysis that is going to create a difference between the markets, and that could also impact the, the overall balance of supply and demand across the different markets. When we go from one level of wind transfers from the hard market to a different value of wind transfers into the RTD market, what we are really talking about is a reduction of imports, unrealized transfers, or a loss of supply. And this is critical to understand because in the past we have discussed that in the HASP market, only hourly interties are financially binding. Any other schedule, either for internal CAISO resources or EIM resources, those schedules are part of the solution, but they are not financially or operationally binding. Granted, there may be some commitments here and there that happens at any time, not just in the HASP process, but in any FMM process. But I'm talking about the schedules, the energy schedules. So as part of the solution, they have to be generated. They are part of the supply-demand balance, but they are in nature advisory. An advisory in this case means that once we determine an optimal clearing value for the transfers in the HASP market, there is nothing that holds that fixed all the way through the RTD market. And we have seen at play in the very critical days of July. We may have, in some cases, an advisory HASP transfer of 3,000 megawatts for the CAISO import. And when we go into the RTD, it actually flipped the direction and now became an export of 200 megawatts. So it was an unrealized transfer of the whole um, direction of 3,000 plus 200. Because again, there is nothing that holds, fix, or, or keeps that in, uh, for the CAISO or for practical purposes for any EIM area uh, across the market. Every market is going to be determining the optimal transfers. And once we go into the RTD, these are the ones that matter because the wind transfers in RTD are the byproduct of, again, the, the dispatches of resources across the different areas. And once we start sending instructions to the resources to follow those dispatches, we are realizing those transfers. If we have an excess of supply in the CAISO, and that means we are producing more than our own demand in the middle of the day, and we issue those instructions for optimal dispatches, by that time, the implied transfers of sending power out as an export transfer is going to be operational binding because we are materializing that transfer by means of enforcing and issuing those resource dispatches. And uh, the complication here is twofold. The first, one, the first one is that when we determine the optimal scales in the HASP process, even though the transfers are advisory, they do influence the mix of interties that are financially and operational binding. So if, for instance, you are relying on EIM transfers imports into the CAISO to support or clear certain level of exports, even though those imports are advisory, they help to find out the optimal level of clearing exports that are hourly scheduled in the HASP process. Whatever happens after that HASP market for the transfers, it will not change the equation for those hourly exports because it was the HASP. That was the last opportunity to, to rebalance the, the entire transactions. Granted, there may be a couple of resources here and there that are 15-minute basis, and they can be re-optimized in the 15-minute basis, but the majority, for practical purposes, we are talking about hourly inter schedules. 
So in this case, the determination of the optimal value of the WIM transfers may play a role in the determination of the volumes of the imports and exports hourly schedules that we create in the HAS process. And when we go into the RTD market, even though the transfers now are financially and operational binding, they do not influence those hourly scale because that is already behind us. And that, and these were clear 70 minutes ago. And even if the green transfers for the RTD market for the Kaiso change in either direction, adding or subtracting a supply, it will not change the equation of what the hourly interties were clear. That is already too late to rebalance those interties. And that is the complication. When we were clearing exports, for instance, that were real-time uh, service schedules, that was with the with the consideration of how much uh, wind transfer imports we may have. Once they are unrealized in the RTD market, we still hold these hourly exports, and we have to honor those through the process. And therefore, the Kaiser now has to find out where that extra capacity that is no longer present through the wind transfers is going to be coming from. Next slide, please. I think I've covered quite a lot of this, but let me cover the last point. And this is something that we can go more into the detail in the next slide. The exports that are coming through the intertire schedules can be of different types. And there are many different ways to organize the and group this in hourly export. We may have exports that come through the day ahead market, they get clear, they may get certain priority, they may be supported by certain non array resources. There may be other exports that are part of a wheel transaction. So uh, for the purpose of this analysis, we took all this out of the equation and we're considering only effectively what we call the static uh, exports. Uh, even for the import equations and pictures that you can see in the in the presentation and in the analysis, uh, we are considering only the static imports. We are not considering pseudotypes or dynamic resources. We are not considering the legs of the imports or exports for wheel transactions because they are imbalanced. They don't add or subtract capacity. This is a discussion about supply capacity. And uh, then you may have different types of uh, static self uh, exports. They may come in from the day ahead market. They may be economically bidding into the market. They may be just price takers. They have no priority in terms of having a non array resource supporting their export. And they can show up in the real time. There is one feature in the market that allows uh, these resources to come and simply put a self schedule in the real time. And if they clear, great. And if they put self-schedule, obviously they are going to be outbidding any economical exports because self-schedule, by its own definition, is going to have a higher priority than any other economical export coming into the system. And the fact that they are willing to be price takers is going to put them at the top of the export priorities for the real time. Next slide, please. Okay, I think we have a question. This could be a good time. Operator, can we Here. open the line? Yeah, this is Michelle Peter from the CCC. So I, I guess I have a, just sort of a, a couple of questions. So then does it become a reliability issue for California if we have firm exports being supported by non-firm WEAM transfers? Well, I think it depends on a series of factors, right? It depends how we are overall in, in our system. We can take the extreme of the spectrum and say that, yeah, if we have nothing else left available, uh, obviously this is additional capacity that was projected and is no longer available. Uh, it's really uh, condition specific and in concept in the extreme case, yeah, it could it could ch pose a challenge for, for our power balance. Okay. And I mean, I guess this is why I brought this up, but doesn't clearing HASP imports, which can be non-firm as well, if they don't tag it pretty, make this worse? Well, 
And this is not a, a new discussion, right? We we have recognized that there has been some percentage of imports historically that have not performed, that they have deviated, and that is the whole reason we initiated this explicit effort of the intertie deviation settlements to to create the market incentives to to encourage those imports to to realize, and that is part of the reason we also have this intertie deviation added. That is uh, an extra requirement that we impose to ensure that we can have uh, the consideration that uncertainty is related to intertie deviation as well. So uh, it's a factor. It's not a new component, uh, and we have spent a lot of effort trying to to create the right marketplace and incentives for for that deviation to to be minimized. Right, but since we're looking at this. Isn't it important for us to determine what portion of this is because of lean transfers and which portion of this is because of half imports failing to materialize? I mean, because part of the issue is you guys did create the intertie penalties, but maybe those penalties aren't working. So don't we have to look at this in concert so we can see the whole picture? Oh, yeah. And I think we we did at least one round of analysis for the entire deviation other. We can continue to do analysis to see how it's performing, and we reported that in in one of the previous rounds, Michelle. So yes, the uh, intertie deviation settlements performance is something that we is in our plate to to continue to assess. But shouldn't it be considered in conjunction with this because they both operate in the same direction? Oh yeah, right. the, granted they operate the same direction, right? But here I think we are trying to be very explicit about this the interaction with the wind transfer that is one dynamic i'm not saying it's the only one and the only one that we should be looking at but we want to really focus on this interaction specific to the wind transfers and we will continue to analyze the, the other interaction that is the intertie deviation okay so in the second part of the presentation today will you guys be discussing that The half to the intertie. So I, I I get it that this is just wean transfers, but now I'm asking, are you going to be looking at I mean, they're both reliability issues and I'm trying to decide which one um is more important or if they're combined important. Like what if it turns out that usually the half is the problem and we really need to look at those uh we need to look at those penalty provisions and you know, we fix this but we still have this other problem. So Yeah. Uh, I hear you. I I, I would say I would characterize this to be uh, eventually having a similar impacts on the outcome. I don't see this to be affecting the same dynamic, right? Because the deviation is it's not something that the has market is doing, right? The market is clearing based on the information that it has available. It has nothing better to, to clear the market against. It's a matter of whether that uh, transaction that was bid in and that was clear yeah. based on that information is going to perform in the real time. This other dynamic that we are discussing here is slightly different because this is not something that uh, is based on explicit bidding, right? The, and that is the reason I was very uh, uh, okay. targeted yeah, on the fact I... that the transfers are a byproduct of all the yeah. internal dispatches of resources. So it's not something that somebody is bidding to realize an amount of transfers and then they step back or they didn't perform. It's completely different dynamic in that sense. Okay. So I, I totally get it, and I see why you would look at them separately. I guess the way I was looking at them is that we have firm exports um, that we are uh, that we will be supporting on the backs of potentially non-firm wean transfers, or potentially on the backs of past imports that don't show up. That's the way I was viewing it. But thanks for your clarification. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, we have another question from Libby. Yeah, hey, Guillermo, this is Libby Kirby from BPA. Um, I, I'm still learning about all the other CAISO markets, so forgive me if this is uh, not a great question, but I, I'm assuming that the underlying assumption here is that exports that are made in the half relative to advisory uh, EIM information are they not then fed back into the RTD in order to ensure, like, it sounds like what's happening is there are RTD imports in the advisory, so you make a HASP export award, but then system conditions change, and so the 
RTD is no longer sending those imports. But I guess I would have expected that once you made the HAS export award, you would have like fed that back into the RTD as part of the uh, like you know load obligation or or whatever, and that would cause the RTD to continue to dispatch those imports to you in order to meet that. Is 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 that part of the disconnect, or is that something that's supposed to be that way? Can you give me a little context there? Yeah. I Thank you for the description. I would say that the description that you just indicated holds for the hourly intertie resources, that once they are clearing HASP, and that is the last time they are optimized and determining optimally what the scale should be. They are not uh, reassessed in subsequent markets. So if an hourly export or import for practical purposes cleared in the HASP market, that is going to basically hold fix for the subsequent 15 and five minute markets. They will not be reoptimized. But that only so, holds so for the hourly intertype resources. Th that part makes sense to me. I guess what I'm wondering though is if it's not reoptimized, then that export expectation should be fed into the RTD. So it surprises me that if the RTD knows that there's this export obligation that was optimized in the half that says, you know, hey, it, a thousand is the number we decided. And the only way to serve that thousand previously was those import resources in the advisory that the RTD would go, okay, well, I still have to meet a thousand. So it's either going to ink your resources or it's going to continue to send imports. Right. Yeah. And that's a great point. Yeah. If somehow the HASP solution was able to find that uh, in order to balance the exports that continues to happen through the real time markets, it requires a certain level of imports. The, the, the intuition is that, well, the export is going to be there in RTD. How can it be that the imports are going to be something much less than what was originally projected to be needed to clear those exports? Yeah, I see the point. And I think one of the dynamics at play here is that the conditions do change across the market between HASP and RTD. And there is a variety of factors that may play a factor, including the consideration of the uh, load conformance that we have in the in the HASP and FMN market that when it comes to the RTD is typically not about the same size. Okay, okay. Because I think I, I, I think I was thinking system conditions before like, oh, now someone has less solar or wind or more load or something that would cause a re-optimization, but that would still, I would assume, send inks um, or or dispatch your resources, but I think what you're saying is the load conformance, because it's that piece that is explicitly offsetting, it specifically offsets sort of the balance. It's not that some other piece got re-optimized, it's that that actually ends up with a difference in the in the total, like in the absolute value of what is being sent. Yeah, I, and, but let me clarify, the load conformance would be one of different variables that can really change across the market. I'm just pointing to some of those. Uh, another factor, obviously, is that on these critical days, uh, when we have these hot uh, weather conditions, uh, we have seen historically, at least for the 2020, that we had a lot of variability, right? So it's expected that the load is going to change, that the renewable generation is going to change and is going to move rapidly. And there are, there are still many variables, components at play here when you go from one market to the other, just because of the inherent time gap between the two markets. That is about 70 minutes in advance. Okay. I, I guess that part, that part is the piece, I guess, that confuses me. Because I would imagine, like, let's say uh, between the half and the RTD, you've got more solar for what, you know, the variability is high. And so the solar increases relative to what you saw in the half. That might cause fewer imports, but then you should be able to meet the exports because the solar is producing. Like that's the piece that confuses me. On things can change, but if it's solving around the same place, even with the components changing, you should get the same expectation. I guess the load conformance is the only one that makes sense to me that would actually alter the the net, like the the total amount of what's happening. What's I, like generation plus imports minus exports. Yeah. Uh, I, I hear you. Now, the the practical implication is that when we have all these other uncertainties and variability taking place, they, they can really play in either direction, right? There is no guarantee that when the solar is going to move, it's going to be only moving in the direction of giving us additional supply. It can actually go in the other way quite easily. And for the load, totally. 
But I would yeah. expect like if the solar if the solar went down and oh, sorry, hang on one sec. <laughs> okay, I think in the meantime she comes back and Michelle, do you have another question or is your hand? Yeah, this right is from the I guess I just wanted to respond to that. So um, here's the problem that I see with this. Um, like on July 9th, um, the the market, the half market, cleared exports maybe in the volume of three or four thousand megawatts, and then we lost the import tie due to the fire, and 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 then in the RTD we didn't have the imports that we were the wean imports we were expecting, and we still honored the exports out of the system because it was post half. Um, and that's a reliability issue, and that's the issue I think um, you know that that I see with this is that once you get past the half, we honor the exports as firm exports, even though they're they're relying on non-firm wean transfers and non-firm half imports at the ties. So there's a, a disconnect in my mind for that you know 70 minute where California bears the you know bears the exports. I mean during stress systems conditions, California is import dependent. So to the extent that we're exporting, it's because we're getting imports. And so if those imports don't come, and then we're responsible for supporting the exports post half, that to me seems like a reliability issue. Michelle, that, that, makes, that makes perfect sense to me. I just want, sorry, the dog stopped barking. Um, I just want to say, <laughs> I, I guess I was thinking about conditions like, you know, changes in load or generation, which made sense. I, I had not thought about a system condition like not having the top eye open for inner ties. So I could see that being a system condition that would actually change the ability because you're now relying on imports, uh, or, excuse me, you're relying on your own generation to such a degree relative to that expected import. Right. So I, I, think, I think it's clearer. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Lily. Yeah, Michelle, I, I, I hear you. I, and I think it's important to, to try to keep the uh, the different items in perspective, right? At the end of the day, all this is about the has market. Uh, but I would like to, to still preserve the, the delineation among the different issues because what you're indicating is it's, a com it's completely unrelated to the transfer, right? It's what to do when you have this massive loss of imports like what we have in the July 9th and how that is going to play with the export. That is on its own, not related to the wind transfer. It's not related to the internal logic of the of the balancing of intertie resources. Right. It, it, yeah. I, I hear your I hear your point, but I would like to make sure that we don't uh, uh, tangle the discussion in terms of how that plays uh, with the transfers. Granted, everything is uh, interrelated because it's one single market that is clearing everything. I, I hear right. that. But, but the issue is, I mean, I get it that that is a, an edge case, but it's an edge case that illustrates the issue, which is that we have firm exports that are being supported based on non-firm imports. And that creates a reliability issue because those non-firm imports do not have to show up, right? They can pay the penalty and we will still support the firm export after the half process. So to me, that's the reliability issue that we're dealing with. And that's why to me, it has both the wean transfer component and it has the half comp transfer component. But I get, I get it that we're focusing on the wean transfer component right here for EIM purposes, so thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, do we have, okay, I think we have one more question. Hi, this is Robert Fisher with NV Energy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Robert. Thank you, Irma. Um Just uh, one quick comment in regards to the, uh, to the import uh, cut between the hours. Um, we're talking about a, a very specific reliability situation in which the operators can take action afterwards. Um, so I, I, I agree with you in regards to the fact that this situation, that situation is um, quite unique in regards to the information that you're trying to present um, about how the transfers are supporting additional exports. So I wanted to make that point. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Do you still have a question, Libby, or is your hand from the previous round? Okay. Okay, let me go. Okay. <laughs> I don't think we have any other questions. Let me move on to the presentation. And 
this is starting to put some light on how the hourly intertides uh, coming to the market. And again, the references for the week of July 9, there are other two sets of days that we have in the report. And the idea here is give you the composition of the bits for the imports. And obviously we have the typical groups that are those that relate to the transmission ownership rights, the existing transmission rights, TORs, TTPs. They are kind of fixed with high priority. They are going to be uh, at the bottom of the stack because they are not going to be touched unless we have to really reach that extreme level of reducing import. We also have uh, the ahead priority and real-time priority. And now keep in mind, uh, while we are analyzing summer 2021, we have to to switch our minds to realize what time frame we are dealing with, because we did have some changes about the scheduling priorities that happened on August 4th. So there is a before and after that day, and we need to keep that in perspective. But in general, at least for the July, we still have this concept of the day ahead priorities and the real time uh, uh, priority. And then the economical bits, and they are sorted in ascending order, and you can see that the dotted line is trending the clear amount of imports for this type of participation altogether. And typically, what you expect is that on high load days, tight supply conditions, we are going to be clearing as much as imports as we can, right? And that is the reason you're going to see that, in general, the trend on the left and hand side, the dotted line, is going to be hovering on the economical bid range because. Everything else is a service schedule, and sure, we can take any service schedule type of imports into the system because it's just a guarantee a supply that we can have. Uh, you may realize, for instance, that things are not aligning very well for the late hours of July 9 and July 10. You can see that the clear line is eating into the area of the service schedule. Well, just remember, this is the day where we have this massive this rate on the marine and open constraints, and therefore not even the day ahead scales could be fully on, or even though they were set the scales, we have to, to cut to some extent those uh, imports. But beyond that, you can see that the dotted line, the clear values are hovering on the red portion, that is the economical bid range. And I, I would caution also because this is obviously not capturing the the congestion dynamic. This is simply an accounting balancing of supply capacity. But you may have 5,000 megawatts of imports bidding into Malin, and we know that they are not going to be able to flow all together. So there is a caveat here to, to ensure that we don't create expectation that there is all the supply that is readily and accessible through the import because uh, intertie limitations may become a factor in certain conditions. On the right hand side, the, the trend that you see here is the zoom of the economical bit. We are zooming in to looking at the specific breakdown, the composition of the economical bit for interties. And they are sorted from cheapest to most expensive uh, bit uh, components. They are by ranges of prices. And depending on the conditions, you can see that uh, there is some level of economical participation that is successfully clearing. And there may be other conditions that is preventing that capacity to be really accessible, like congestion, and that could be the case. And there may be other cases like in July 9 and 10, that capacity is there, the bits were in there, but effectively because of the rates and they could not be clearing. The overall picture here is that when you compare the composition of the different types of participation for the imports, a small portion is economically bidding or participating in the market. The gross majority of the imports are some type of service scalers. Next slide, please. Let me cover the next one and we can take questions. The next slide is the same construct that we have, but this is for the export. And on the left hand side, you have the whole composition organized by the different types of self scales and economical bits. And on the right hand side, mm -hmm. it's a zoom in of the economical range. And 
similar to, to the import. You can see that the majority of the exports that are coming into the CAISO through early interdice, these are not transfers, these are explicit bits, uh, self scale for uh, intertie transactions applicable to the CAISO system. Now, the interesting part here is that uh, the majority of those are self scales and they are composed between the day ahead and the real time. The day ahead used to be that priority in which if you clear in the day ahead market, regardless of the nature of your export in the day ahead market, and you come into the real time market, you could have this day ahead priority. Then for any last minute export that could come into the system, they can either participate economically or they can self scale in real time, be just price takers. You can see the volume of the last minute just show up in real time export that is denoted with the section in green. That is uh, that is growing specifically in the critical days of July 9, July 10. You can see a sizable amount, and the economical participation is pretty negligible. It's pretty small, and it makes sense. These are the tight dates where the exports are really trying to secure capacity, and they are willing basically to be price takers. So the the economic participation is quite small, unexpected. And uh, that would be really how the, the exports are composed. And uh, let me see, I think we have one question from Dan. Hey, Gary, Dan Williams from... Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, Dan Williams from Customized Energy Solutions. So um, looking back on slide 13, I just want to be clear at what we're looking at here. So the the day ahead priority um, imports that are coming in, those may have been economically bid in the day ahead market and potentially economically rebid in the real time market. But the, um, the colors that you're showing as economically bid, et cetera, that's just relative to the the new real-time market bids that were submitted. I'm kind of just yes. losing a little bit what that kind of large amount of aqua color is and if it's as, um, uh, you know, singular as, as shown. Yeah, and the, the aqua color is effectively those that participated in the day ahead market regardless of how they participate. They could have self schedule, they could have uh, economical bids. By virtue of clearing the day-ahead market, they could come into the real-time market with self schedules and then have this higher day-ahead priority. If a resource clearing the day-ahead market and instead prefer to economically bid in the real-time market, it wouldn't show up in the aqua color, it would be in the red one because it's an economical bit. So the, the the priority was given to these exports once they were able to clear in the day ahead market and they could come with a higher priority than any economical bit, higher than any real time self schedule. Okay. And then on the export side, um, have you looked at how much of that um, real time self schedule amount that sort of greenish color um, is uh, covering um, for uh, IFM export awards that cleared IFM but then were curtailed in RUC and are now just rebidding as, as real-time exports um, in the real-time market? So I've been trying to no. map, I guess, between those two yeah. actions. Yeah, I, I see your point. They are saying just to to secure the same capacity they intend to get the, from the day ahead. Yeah, right. that could be a different angle we can take. We we are not showing that in this phase of analysis. If we have time, we may be able to, to go into that. I, I see the, the, the interplay that you want to, to highlight. It, yeah, it's just kind of filling in the picture. I, you know, I know some of this stuff is just like, you can't really look at it from an analysis perspective, but just trying to drill down on some of these days and sort of see how the market was reacting and then what impact the, you know, the RUC decisions are having and then the, the load conformance as well across these kind of horizon of um, 
activities from from IFM through RUC in real time. But thanks for uh, kind of clarifying what what's a little bit deeper in in there. Yeah, uh, and now that I recall, Dan, we have done so much analysis about July events and specific to July 9. I believe that in the summer report for July, uh, we actually have some tracking of the cuts that were happening in the rock process that then were tra they were attempted to be reinstated in the has process or the ones that materialize that didn't materialize in rock and then still happening has we we have so much if I recall and so let me check back and maybe you can yeah. also take a read at the at the summer report for July because I remember we put specific methods for those uh, uh, critical days. Yeah, you did, and I actually you know prefer looking at some of the information that you've shown for August and September when we're in you know we're in situations where there wasn't kind of that one-off um, you know inner tie going down type of a scenario, but it's more just a tight supply condition day and seeing how the market's responding to that across the you know, uh, different market horizons. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that you, you know, rounded out that uh, conversation by providing some of those kind of non-exceptional days. Yeah, I see the point. Thank so, you. Thank you. Okay, let's move to the next slide then. Uh, there are two concerns. Uh, at this point, we have discussed this uh, implicitly, but let me just to highlight those explicitly. Uh, from the previous discussion that we had in the resource efficiency evaluation and all these discussions of the summer conditions, uh, there have been two main concerns. One is that given the fact that the wind transfers in the HAS market are advisory in nature, uh, they could end up supporting hourly export that later on when the unrealized transfers happen, uh, now represents an imbalance to, to the CAISO area. The second concern has also been that the CAISO during these tight supply conditions, like those of July events, may be relying on the wind transfers to meet its own load obligation. Uh, the, this could be at least uh, different facets of, uh, of a problem that we want to to further analyze. And we did some level of analysis in this area. So let me move to the next slide. There are, there are many variables to consider, but trying to address one of these concerns, uh, we could come with this very simplistic metric. And this is something that we also uh, discuss in the July 9 events. And granted, this is an outlier case, but the dynamics is there. So we just borrow that logic to expand it to other days. Uh, the, the correlation here we're trying to, to put together is that on one end, we have different type of exports. But if we only focus on the exports that come in the real-time market, that they didn't have any prior priority or uh, arrangements, and they are just showing up in the real time, either with economical bids or real time self scale price takers. That is a portion that is just up to the real time market to see how much it can afford to, to clear. There is no day ahead uh, conditional factors that could infer that they have to be honored because they, are, they were already taken into account or factored in in the day ahead market solution. These are just last minute exports showing up in the real time market. That is going to be the portion that is in either orange or green colors. These are the hourly exports showing up into the real time market. The other area is the transfers uh, for the Kaiso specific area. And these are in either direction. Positive is an import wind transfer into the CAISO. Negative is a wind transfer export out of the CAISO. And we want to see the balance because on one end, if we're talking just about the real time, the hourly exports in green and red is the 
additional exports that the Kaiso system may need to support based on the conditions that the term is able to, to, to clear. But at the same time, we are relying in certain level of wind transfers that are coming from the different areas into the Kaiso system. So it's, it's like trying to do the accounting, how much goes out, how much comes in, in the real-time market construct. And the, and the construct here is really the RTD market. Obviously, in the RTD market, the hourly transactions, exports, green and red, are going to be already fixed. They are not going to be adjusted or optimized. The ones in blue that are the five-minute green transfers are really the ones that effectively are going to be operationally binding. These are the uh, transfers that are going to realize through the instructions of different resources. Effectively, that is the additional transfers, the additional supply that the Kaiso gains through the wind transfer imports. And in this case, you can start to see the picture. We're trying just to do this balancing accounting logic of how much comes in, how much goes out in the real-time construct. And the line in black is the net between the two. A positive black line would mean that we have additional supply effectively coming into the system. A negative line is going to say that effectively we are in a net export position because the export that we have to honor from the real-time market are larger than the amount of total import transfers we are getting into the system. And uh, this highlights the specific week of July 9. And if you look at specifically the peak hours, uh, early in the day, in the middle of the day, we know we are going to have plenty of supply. There is uh, uh, the set of conditions that allow us to, to even export uh, transfers during that time of the day. But if we focus on the critical hours of the day, peak hours, hour ending 18, 19, 20, 21, we can see that systematically we clear these hourly exports up to certain volume. And in most of the cases, we also have import transfer coming into the Kaiso system. And they happen to be smaller than the overall export. So the net balance for the Kaiso is that it's in a net export condition. The import that we're bringing to the system are not effectively to to support our own load obligation is effectively to support to great extent the exports that clear in the real time market through the HAT process. And this is basically, we could see that that balance effectively of the imports coming into the system and then going through by means of exports uh, looks like a willing transaction, right? It's just the mechanism that is more optimal for the system to realize that we can clear these many imports and then they can be utilized to support the exports. And this is consistent for these days. If you look at the report, there are other sets of days in which the conditions change just because there is more capacity available and the dynamics of the market are slightly different. Let me move to the next slide. Now, this is just in an accounting exercise. The, the more surgical analysis is really trying to determine out of the unrealized wind import transfers that we have in a given point on time, how much of that could pose a challenge because they were supporting originally the clearing of additional exports? Uh, this is a question we cannot answer with the original market solution alone. There is no vehicle, there is no data point that could give us an answer to that simple question. What we have done, and it's similar to what we did for the load conformance analysis that was provided in the first round, is to do a counterfactual analysis. And obviously, it's based on some assumptions with some limitations, but this is at least a tool that can give us uh, put us one step closer to try to answer the question. And what we have done is a counterfactual analysis, and that requires that we effectively rerun the market. And this requires a, a few assumptions, but let me give you the construct of what the, the counterfactual analysis is. 
we know what the original solution was. We know the schedules, we know the prices, we know the EIM transfers. We know what the transfers were for the HASP market and how much of those actually realized in the RTD market. So we know the CAISO import transfers in HASP and also the WIM EIM transfer imports into CAISO in RTD. And any difference is the on realization of those WIM transfers. So let's say we have 3,000 megawatts of transfers imports coming into the CAISO in HASP. And when we come into the RTD, they realize to be only 1,000 megawatts. So we have these 2,000 megawatts of unrealized EIM transfers in RTD. What we have done is take that reference of the RTD transfers, the 1,000 megawatts. And now we come back to the HASP market. We impose those optimal transfers to be the upper limitations on the transfers. That means if we clear a thousand megawatts of imports in RTD, we're going to go back and rerun the HASP market and not allow to flow more than a thousand megawatts of imports. We are forcing HASP to clear at no more transfers than what RTD clear. And in that case, we are forcing HASP to somehow realize up to the amount of transfers that were realized effectively in RTD. And then we see what is the consequence of that. When we adjust down the imports, naturally we are effectively changing the solution. We are changing the variables, the construct of what the solution is going to look like. We still have the same demand to meet. We still have the same pool of supply resources to dispatch, but the overall economics is going to change. And one of those changes is going to be the the mix of the intertie transactions, how much additional or reduction of imports we may have, how much reduction or additional clearing of exports we may have, and how the internal resources for the CAISO are going to be reoptimized once we have this uh, limitation imposed in the HASP market. We wanted to do this for the HASP market because this is the opportunity to clear the out interties. If we do this for the SMN, the, the interties are not going to change. So it's going to be only related to internal resources. And remember, the major buyback that we have identified is happening from the HASP all the way to the, to the RTD. There is a middle step in the SMN. But if you look at from HASP to, to RTD, you can recapture the, the buyback. And this is how we came with the, with the counterfactual analysis. So in this case, we did that specifically for one, for two hours, one hour for the critical date of July 9, and another hour for July 11. July 11 happens to be a, a day in the second set of critical days where we still have high load conditions. And we wanted to prove the concept to see how it could work. The expectation is that between now and the final report that we're going to put together by the end of May, we can do this counterfactual analysis for, for more days. Ideally, we want to have as many days as we did for the load conformance and be able to have a more meaningful sample of the results to, to ensure that we are not basing the conclusion on one outlier day like July 9. And you can see even with this two-hour sample, the the conclusions can be couldn't be more apart than what you are going to see. For the first day, this is July 9, and we pick our ending 19 just to to have a reference that is capturing the peak conditions. The transfer that we saw between HASP and RTD are are quite different, and the numbers are defined in the in the paper. Once we reduce by that much the transfer capability in the HAS market and rerun the market, effectively the dots with the dotted line are indicating how much reduction of transfers happen from HAS to RTD, and we are putting that back into the RTD market. So effectively for the second interval, for instance, we see a value that is about 1,600 megawatts, the, the market is about 1,600 megawatts. Well, we are saying that in 
the original solution, the difference of transfer between HASP and RTD were about 1,600 megawatts, 1,600 megawatts less in RTD than HASP. So we limited HASP by that much. And when we impose those limitations in HASP, the, the optimization gives us the, the following solution. And we capture this in an aggregated fashion, effectively in three groups. How much the exports change, how much the imports change, and how much the internal generation change. So in this case, when we uh, adjust the transfers to match what was feasible in RTD, what we found out that is that for this specific out, the majority of the change was absorbed by a reduction of exports, and that is the gray area that you can see in the plot. By reducing the transfer capability to match what actually was realized in RTD, the consequence would have been that we couldn't clear that many exports in the HASP market, or say the other way around. The, the unrealized wind import transfers between HASP and RTD were supporting this much additional exports in the range of 1,500 megawatts. There are small changes to the imports. In some cases, actually, it's a reduction. You see, if it is a negative value, it's not a, an import increase, it's an import reduction. And the internal movement of resources could also be a factor. They are relatively small. The majority of the change is, effect, is absorbed by reduction of exports. Let, let me move to the next slide, and then we can take questions. The second case is the same construct. We didn't change anything of the, of the logic. It's just picking a different day, and we pick also the same hour, hour in the 19th. In this case, the dotted line with the markers are indicating how much transfers we are clamping down in the HASP market to reflect the RTD realized transfers. And when we impose that extra limitation on the transfers in the HASP market, the, the movement of resources in the, in the new solution is capturing this trend. The majority of the changes because of the transfers is actually with movement of internal resources of KISO. Effectively, this means that if we had less transfers in has to market, uh, the solution for the exports, for instance, would remain effectively the same. But there is a small portion that you can see, maybe 50, 100 megawatts of less exports. But the majority of the changes would represent just a switch from supporting the demand of and load obligation of KISO plus exports through a shifting from wind import transfers to be absorbed now by internal resources. And I, I was thinking what rationale this means. And actually, it's, it's quite logical. And I think this is part of the complication that is expected to see when we want to analyze trend over different times of the day or through the summer. July 9 is a critical day where we know we were very tight in supply. It makes sense that any loss of EAM, EAM transfers, imports, eh, are not going to be replaced by internal generation because effectively we don't have internal generation. So the only option is going to be to start reducing exports. So we cannot ink supply, well, we have to reduce sub, eh, demand, in this case, exports. When we move to other days, like August 11, that is still with relatively high load conditions, but not as critical as July 9, the solution also makes sense because it effectively is indicating we still have internal supply available in the KISO to hold, relatively speaking, the same levels of export. So this reduction of wind transfers only means that we are shifting the supply mix. Instead of relying on the wind transfers, we are able to support that with internal resources. And here you have that the majority of the change is absorbed by moving internal resources up. So it's just effectively an economic displacement because there is capacity available. That, that is a critical piece. If there is capacity available, there, this will become more like an economical displacement. And this really highlights one of the 
the attributes that are at play with the exports. The majority of the exports that we have in the real time are self-schedulers. That means they are price takers. They are willing to take any price. And that has a further implication in terms of what the market is going to be doing to try to clear the market. Because they are price takers, they are self-scales, they can really drive the full utilization of any supply available, not only the Kaiser system, but across the EIM, because it's economics. So the fact that they are self-scales, they are willing to go up to the price cap, effectively, and that means any supply is going to be merit to be able to meet that additional export requirement. And as long as the capacity is there, it's going to to fully utilize that capacity. It's not a matter of economics because, again, these are price takers, and therefore they are going to be willing to take the up to the price cap. And therefore, any capacity that is available, that is accessible through the RAM capability, could potentially be able to, to meet those self-scaled uh, exports in the real time. And when you don't have that capacity, the only consequence is to reduce these self-scaled. If there is capacity, even if it is pricey, the market still may, may be able to find a way to, to provide those exports by economical displacement. And again, this is a, a proof of concept that we put to try to answer that question. What, what is the implication of having these unrealized wind transfers from the HAS to the RTD market? The expectation, again, is that we can do this now more for, for many other hours to have a more meaningful sample and realize what are the wider trends. One hour doesn't make a trend, and you can see that the two hours are telling you quite different stories. And they are logical, they are rational, but we want to see how it looks once we do that for a wider sample of data. Okay, so let's take a couple of questions that we see in the queue. Operator? Yeah, this is Michelle. So I just wanted to say on your um, identification of the problem, so I have two questions. Um, can the CAISO fail the RSE because the exports are included in the resource efficiency evaluation, but the WEAN transfers are not? Okay, you're asking me now to switch my brain here. <laughs> so, I kind of follow the question, but what, what is the implication for the export? What What is the scenario you want yeah, to so highlight the, for the exports? Yeah, so the implication being that the EIM resource efficiency test includes the exports that clear the hourly half process, but the, the WEAM uh, EIM resource efficiency test does not include the, uh, the WEAM transfers, the expected transfers, right? So you can yes. fail the test. Right, because the exports are firm, but you're, you don't consider the WEAM transfers. I mean, the whole purpose of this is to look at the EIM resource efficiency test, right? And so. Yeah, I, yeah, I see your point. And um, yes, uh, for, the, for the capacity test, we include the hourly schedules as part of the net scale interchange. Yes, they are going to be factored in and because we don't account for the wind transfers. If, yeah, that, that would be an imbalance. For the flexible ramping test, uh, in that requirement, we only have yeah, the no, mechanism of load. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm worried about it. So we can fail the capacity test because we've, um, we've scheduled export thinking that we're going to get the WEAM transfers, but the WEAM transfers don't go into the capacity test. That's what I'm saying. Correct. We don't account for the WEAM transfers in the capacity test, and the exports that we clear are going to be part of the net schedule interchange. They are factored okay. correct. Okay. So my other question is, post hasp the exports are self-scheduled, right? So what is more important post hasp is it load in California or is it the export? <laughs> I hear your question, Michelle, but I think I'm not ready at this point to start this debating the scaling priority between demand and export because I don't think this is the, the point of the discussion. Now, 
the question has to be asked in what time frame you are talking about, because we have different priorities before and after August 4th. And right now, by the priorities that we file and that we have in place by the current tariff provisions, they are effectively the same priority. Right. But I guess I would just note on November 9th, we, after the half process, we still supported the exports, but went into a stage two and three, right? Yeah, but uh, I hear you what you're saying, but I don't grasp what the question is. Oh, I'm just asking. I mean, uh, I mean, after half, you have self-scheduled exports and you have load, and somebody has mm -hmm. to decide what to do. And I'm just saying, what does the system tell us to do, and what do we do in practice? But we have to realize that again, it goes back to the time frame. If we're talking about the market, the scheduling priorities explicitly defined through the different relative priorities and the penalty prices that we have in the system are to effectuate those priorities through the market. And once you have a condition in the market, the market is going to honor this based on the on the framework that we have. If now you are talking about past the market, that is not a market solution, but what operationally we should be doing, I think that is a completely different discussion. Okay, then I guess maybe I'm asking about the, the penalty provisions. So in the penalty provisions, does self-scheduled exports going into the final run have a higher priority to load or equal priority to load? They have the same priority. Well, it depends. Are you talking before the August 4 or after August 4? Are you talking about real-time self-schedules or are you talking about high-priority exports? So uh, we have to be more nuanced on what, what the discussion needs to be. Okay, you know what? I'll go look in the penalty provisions. I thought there was um, something going into the real time where exports that uh, cleared the real time had a $5 higher penalty price. But I will look at that and I will get back to you with my specific question. So thanks. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions on the queue, operator. All right, Jeff, your uh, line is unmuted. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Guillermo. It's Jeff Spires of PowerX. Um, Hi, Jeff. Thanks very much. Hi, thanks very much for the uh, the analysis and the discussions. It's really interesting and helpful. Um, I just wanted to give you some feedback on my reaction to the analysis and just trying to think through what the issue is here. You know, one of the things that you've emphasized in the discussion is um, the impact of unrealized EIM transfers that, that don't materialize in, in real time. Um, but, you know, when I take a step back here, I think there's a broader issue, um, which is you know, setting aside whether or not the, the EIM transfers ultimately materialize in real time or not. I think a, a more fundamental issue is that the HASP optimization can effectively overextend the CAISO BA, leaving the CAISO short headed into the EIM uh, because there is a potential that by clearing more exports, uh, it, it could be that the CAISO can't meet its obligations without effectively needing to backfill those exports with EIM supply. And, and so that's a challenge even before you've arrived at real time, before you know whether those EIM transfers show up or not, um, entering into the EIM and coming out of the HASP, there's this situation where the CAISO BA may be short because it's supported more exports than otherwise would have. And I think that's, in my mind, sort of the fundamental challenge here because, you know, first of all, I, I think that's counter to the, the concept of having a of being resource efficient before the EIM starts, and you know as you've pointed out already here, the CAISO may end up in a reliability issue if those EIM imports don't materialize. But you know even if they do, I think the the other impact is that it it has an effect on the other EIM entities' risks overextending those BAs too, because ultimately those additional exports that the CAISO BA is is allowing are 
based on the assumption of EIM supply being available in those other areas. And so it seems like the outcome could be the entire EIM area in effect becoming a net exporter to support um, the additional exports coming out of the CAISO in the HASP and, and putting more stress on, on the market overall. So uh, in my mind, that's kind of the broader issue here. And it seems like you know, we should be contemplating what potential solutions would there be to try to avoid these outcomes, whether it's you know, finding a way to limit those sales in the first place to an amount that's supportable or a way to more clearly and transparently identify the nature of those exports um, if they aren't supported by supply in the CAISO BA identifying them clearly as non-firm so that it's it's more transparent what the nature of those are. Uh, so anyhow, I don't know if you have a reaction to that, but I just wanted to provide you some high level thoughts on, on what we think the fundamental issue is here that we're trying to solve. No, yeah, thank you, Jeff. I think you are right on point on characterizing from your perspective the bigger issue here. And no, yeah, I couldn't disagree at all on what you are indicating, right? And I would say that is the fundamental reason why we are having this effort and that we are starting with the analysis, because that is within the scope of the phase 1B, phase 2 of the resource efficiency evaluation. And we, we start to put the pieces together to be able to support and have more intelligence and educated discussion moving forward once we launch in the the policy phase, yeah, and so th that is right in the context of an expectation that we have for for moving into the into the policy discussion as to this is the challenge now. What do we do moving forward, right? So I would say that that fits naturally within the scope of our expectation of how we want to to evolve the discussion on this. Okay, thanks, Guillermo. I, I appreciate that. And can I just ask one quick question as well? Please. I don't know if you will have an answer to this, but in your view, do, do you know, does this outcome and the potential for this outcome cause the CAISO operators to use load conformance to a, a greater degree because they have an awareness that they may, when they load conform, it may... Um, or when they're in that situation, they're trying to potentially attract imports. There's also this risk of clearing additional exports. You know, do you think that that plays a role in how much load conformance the operators are using and would trying to find a solution to this problem help with that issue as well or or, or not? Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's a good point, Jeff, because I, I could tell you from from the operational point of view, at least, as far as I have been familiar with these discussions, uh, the operators see a system running and they see what they get, right? Sometimes it would be quite complicated to understand why they are getting some balances or why they may be short-handed in capacity. So that is the, the, the driver for, or one of the reasons to, to start using conformance to, to secure that ramp capability even though they may not precisely know the drivers as to what they are seeing. It's like driving the car, right? You start to know that something is not going well with the car. You don't know exactly what it is, but you, you know what you can do to, to try to mitigate for that condition. Uh, given the dynamic nature of the EIM market, my intuition is that there would be very hard for the players to realize the dynamic nature of all the transfers happening at, in real time to start making those uh, calls. And I think given the trend that we have for load conformance that is somehow uh, consistent over the years, I would expect that is still the primary reason for them, no more than securing capacity, even though they may not precisely know the, the drivers behind what they observe. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks, Guillermo. That's helpful. Thank you, yes. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. 
Hey, Guillermo, Dan from Customized Energy Solutions. Again, I know we're running short on time, so I'll try to make this quick and just say you know, I appreciate you bringing back in the context of the fact that we're in the analysis portion right now, but the, the sort of what do we do about this is what, um, you know, comes next. And it, in that line, I, I um, was actually going to ask something similar to what Jeff, Jeff just did about um, where load conformance fits into this picture, and it does seem like uh, the higher the load conformance in HASP, um, when that gets unwound in, in real time, then that does sort of at least create less pressure on being able to support the exports that have been scheduled in HASP. But for me, this all really just winds back to being a price formation problem. And, um, you know, I know that we're supposed to be having a price formation initiative starting shortly, and I, I hope that we can kind of crosswalk between that initiative and what's been discussed here. Um, and I think it's also good when, when looking at each of these days where you have the examples, it, it'd be good just to throw up the price information on there as well. And yeah, I just took a quick look in the you know, real-time reports from August 11th on this hour, and uh, I think the market was in a $1,000 offer cap stance and um, cleared in the 100 to $300 range. Um, while this activity was going on, and it just uh, you know, if possible, to kind of overlay that with some of this, it might just be helpful down the road um, when trying to have a complete picture of what was going on in the market. Even though I, I know we can all go do that research ourselves. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's try to move quickly to the last question, Kelly. Hey, Guillermo, it's Kelly Wells with WPTF. Um, I will first of all thank you for pulling this analysis together. It's, it's very intriguing and it definitely got me thinking here. Um, but in the interest of time, Dan actually just hit on everything <laughs> I was going to mention. Um, I'll throw one more piece of information that I think um, when you guys do more of these counterfactuals would be useful to have is, and Jeff also I think touched on this as well, are the load levels across the different markets with and without the uh, conformance numbers. So we can kind of get a, the full picture along with the pricing. Um, so that was all I was actually going to comment on. So between Jeff and Dan and adding in the load numbers, I think uh, that was my comment. So thank you. Yeah, I can tell you that is part of the scope that we intend to have for the final round. Yeah, thank you for the suggestion. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, sorry, we are way behind, but I think this is a very important discussion. So it's very good use of our limited time. And we still have a, a second full topic to discuss. And uh, I will hand it over to Katie, that is part of the analysis team. And she's going to be covering the analysis that we have done so far for the intertie deviation adder. Katie, all yours. Thanks, Guillermo. Hi, everybody. This is Katie Wickler with the market analysis and forecasting team. Um, I'm going to be presenting the findings from our analysis on the net scheduled interchange uh, requirements in the WEIM. So I'll try to go through this quickly, um, maybe just get through my slides and we'll try and pause at the end for questions. So uh, next slide, please. So today I'll provide kind of a high level summary of our preliminary findings from this report. And then I'll dive into some more specifics on the actual NSI deviation during our study period, which was the calendar year 2021. Uh, a little bit of the historical performance of the NSI uncertainty requirement, and then some initial findings on the potential correlation of actual NSI deviation with a variety of external factors. Um, I'll also note that the language I use, um, NSI uncertainty requirements, NSI deviation, are analogous to intertie deviation, um, which you may have heard previously. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so previously the CAISO had published an analysis in October of 2021 that examined the historical performance of the capacity test and the impact of the NSI uncertainty requirement in the capacity test um, for a subset of months in 2021. So this analysis is focusing um, kind of on a broader study period the entire year of 2021 um, on uh, specifically historical NSI deviation and the performance of the requirement within the capacity test. So at a high level, our findings from this analysis were as follows. First, we found that the uh, historical approach that's used to calculate the NSI uncertainty requirement 
may not accurately predict the NSI deviation that, that actually realizes. Um, secondly, we saw that the NSI uncertainty requirement uh, consistently exceeded actual deviation during periods of non-coverage. I'll get into that a little bit more. And then finally, we saw that the, you know, the actual realized NSI deviation didn't seem to be clearly correlated with external factors, um, nor did it consistently follow seasonal trends. Next slide, please. All right, so first I just wanted to quickly review how the NSI deviation is calculated in this context, um, and I'll kind of go into the calculation of the uncertainty requirement in subsequent slides, but here I'm just talking about the, the deviation itself. So actual deviation we calculate as the difference between the sum of the base schedules submitted by a WEIM entity at 40 minutes before the hour, T minus 40, and the sum of the tag schedules that are then submitted at T minus 20 minutes before the hour. Uh, this is at an hourly granularity. So EIM entities are expected to submit balance-based schedules, um, including for imports and exports, by T minus 40 minutes before the trading hour. Um, however, there is that NERC NASB deadline for submitting energy tags, which is at 20 minutes before the hour. So as a result, any differences between the energy that's scheduled at T minus 40 and the energy that's tagged at T minus 20 is considered an imbalance to be managed in the real-time markets. Um, more specifically for imports and exports, any deviations between the base scheduled NSI and the tagged NSI is considered an intertie deviation. So in this analysis, we chose to focus in kind of more specifically on the subset of hours of 15 to 23, um, more closely across each month of the year. Um, we also looked at deviation across all hours of each month uh, to investigate any sort of trends between peak and off-peak hours. Um, but at a high level, what we saw was there were no notable seasonal or hourly trends that we could find uh, across BAAs um, in the study period. Next slide, please. It looks like the graph got shifted here a little bit, apologies, but um, here I just provided a sample of the metrics that we produced for each of the BAAs. Um, on this slide here is just a sample metric for the PGE balancing authority, and um, in the report that we published, you can find these graphics represented for all of the BAAs in the appendix. Um, so these graphs here are showing a box and whisker plot. So the box is representing the interquartile range or the 25th through the 75th percentiles of the data. Uh, the line in the center of the box is the median percentile. Uh, the whiskers are showing that one and a half times the interquartile range distance. And then, of course, the dots are representing the outliers here. So overall, across the BAAs, um, we saw that the actual deviation was generally clustered within a tight uh, interquartile range between the hours of 15 through 23. Um, we didn't observe really consistent hourly or seasonal trends across EAAs. And I see Michelle has a question. Michelle, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, this is Michelle from the CPC. When you were looking at the CPC jurisdictionals, were you looking only at the imports that were tagged at T minus 40? Uh, do you mean for the, for the KISO BAA? Yeah. Yeah, so for the, the KISO BAA, the base schedules um, we're looking at are the advisory schedules from the last uh, binding 15-minute market run, I believe. Sorry, I'm not in first well-versed. Does that mean that it's only the ones that have a transition tag? I'm not sure specifically on that detail. Um, Guillermo, do you have any insight there? Yeah. I, 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 is your question, Michelle, if for KISO we're using the, the tax values or not? Or, yeah, or so you else. guys have a T minus 40 transmission tagging requirement, right, for import deviations. And so I'm trying to figure out, are you using imports from, that only have transmission tags or are you using all imports when you're looking at this? Well, I, I know that is the, the tag information that we have at T minus 40. Uh, I will need to check further what are the implications for transmission profile because I thought it would be the same thing. Uh, we can get back to you. That would be helpful. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. 
Um, next slide, please. So another metric that we explored here was how the NSI deviation materialized across both peak and off-peak hours. Um, this graphic here, what we did is we overlaid a box whisker plot on top of a, a type of scatter plot called a jitter plot. Um, the box whisker plot has the outliers hidden and they're instead represented by the blue and the red dots of the jitter plot. So you know, this is kind of an interesting metric to look at, um, but we saw you know, across the BAAs, the deviation outliers generally tended to occur across both peak and off-peak hours with no consistent trend. Um, some BAAs had more deviations that were clustered in the summer months, some had deviations clustered more towards the, the later months of the year, and others still saw kind of a more consistent volume across the entire year. So, you know, we, we didn't see a defined trend that fit across all of the BAAs, and I think this is expected to some extent since the, uh, the different areas can be subject to different conditions, whether that's geographical, weather, or system conditions. Next slide, please. All right, so the next phase or the next portion of our analysis uh, explored the actual performance of the NSI uncertainty requirement that's included in the capacity test and sort of how well that requirement did in predicting actual realized uh, NSI deviations in the study period. Uh, before I dive into these four metrics here, I'll just give a very brief overview of the, the calculation of the requirement. Um, you can refer to the analysis report for, for more details because I know we're a little pressed on time here. But at a high level, uh, the uncertainty requirement for, for the inner tie deviation is intended to account for um, sort of historical deviation between the base scheduled and the tagged net scheduled interchange. Um, it's calculated using a histogram approach, which relies on three months of historical data uh, the histograms are set to ensure that the requirement covers a 95% confidence interval. So the 97.5 and the 2.5 percentiles from the data are chosen, um, and these set the high and the low absolute and relative deviation values. These are then used to calculate the additional NSI uncertainty requirements uh, whose equations can be found in the report. I'll mention here our analysis is focusing specifically on the NSI uncertainty requirement that was calculated for the upward portion of the capacity test in the 2021 study period, since the main focus of these analyses in this context have been to sort of hone in on uh, tight supply conditions. So back to what I have here on this slide, um, the four main metrics that we use to sort of analyze and dig into the historical relationship between the actual deviation and the uncertainty requirement were coverage, uh, requirement, closeness, and exceedance. And I will get into some details about these subsequently. So can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so the coverage metric represents um, sort of the, the pure coverage of the actual NSI deviation by the estimated requirement in the upward direction. Um, basically, this metric shows, averaged on a monthly basis, the percentage of time that the requirement was sufficient to cover the actual realized deviation in the upward direction. So that's reported here on a percentage basis for each of the EIM entities. Um, coverage was generally high across 2021, um, although all of the BAAs except for one, I believe it was the SCL BAA, had at least one month of coverage that was less than 95%. Um, I'll note here, that for the new uh, WEIM BAAs, I think we had five that entered the EIM in 2021, uh, the NSI uncertainty requirement gets set to zero for the first four months of their participation because the requirement really relies on at least three months of production data and the calculation is performed on a month ahead basis. So you'll see we've dropped those kind of first four months for those new entities on this metric just for ease of comparison, making sure we're looking at, at apples to apples here. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So the requirement metric, this is just the um, average megawatt quantity of the NSI uncertainty requirement in the upward direction for each month of the year. Um, there's not a lot to dig into here. You know, as you can see, the requirements are varying in magnitude across BAAs and across the months. Um, 
the CAISO BAA consistently had the, the highest average requirement, which is somewhat expected given uh, the relatively larger size of the system. But again, some variability between BAAs um, with no clearly defined seasonal trend. Good, uh, next slide, please. So the closeness metric we looked at, this is the um, absolute megawatt difference between the actual deviation and the estimated requirement for each year, for each month of the year. Uh, the closeness can be interpreted as sort of a measurement of the accuracy of the NSI uncertainty requirement. So for example, uh, a closeness value of zero megawatts would indicate that the requirement perfectly covered the actual uh, deviation that was realized. Um, you know, on the other hand, a closeness value of uh, 10 megawatts would indicate that the requirement underestimated the actual deviation by 10 megawatts. So that's what, what the closeness metric represents. Um, overall here, the KISO BAA had the largest magnitude of the closeness metric uh, across 2021 with um, variations in magnitude between the BAAs. Um, and, and again, not a really clear, consistent seasonal trend. Next slide, please. So we did a little bit of a deeper dive into this metric, as I mentioned, you know, this is sort of a representation of, of the accuracy of the requirement calculation. So we chose to sort of zoom in on a smaller subset of hours across the month, specifically hours 15 through 23. Um, again, we're using a box whisker plot to represent um, the subset of hours to show the, uh, the range and the outliers of, of the observed metrics. Um, here we're using the SRP BAA as kind of an illustrative example, but again, the rest of the, the metrics can be found in the report. Um, generally, there isn't necessarily a prevailing hourly trend between the BAAs that was observed with this metric. Um, because of how the requirement is calculated, higher deviation values can actually drive up the requirement for corresponding hours in the forward months. So you may kind of see that pattern present for BAAs that have those high hourly deviation outliers. In the forward months, the requirement is sort of driven up. Um, so let's see, it looks like we have a question from Libby. Please go ahead. Hi, Katie. Hi, Katie, thanks. This is Libby from BPA. I just want to check on, on uh, oh geez, where to go, on closeness. Is that, that's inclusive of both times that the requirement was above and times the requirement was below, or is that just one or the other? I think it's both, but I wanted to check. Yeah, so it's, you know, we're, we're looking at kind of the, the difference when um, the, the just, yeah, yeah, the, the average difference when um, the requirement um, was above or below the actual deviation. Okay, just wanted to make sure it was above or below. Cool, thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, the final metric uh, that we used to sort of analyze the historical performance of the, of the requirement was exceedance. Um, and this is the, uh, basically the same metric that I just discussed, um, closeness, but we filtered it on um, intervals of non-coverage. So basically when the estimated requirement was not sufficient to cover the deviation. And again, we average this on a monthly basis across the BAAs. So same metric as before, just filtered on kind of a smaller subset of intervals. Um, during these periods, again, the exceedance sort of varied in magnitude across the BAAs, um, and there's not, not really a, a consistent seasonal trend that we could see um, with this metric. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay. The last sort of component of the analysis explored whether any sort of external factors may have had an impact on how the uh, actual NSI deviation materialized um, during the study period. So specifically, we looked at whether there was any potential correlation between deviation and the five following metrics using um, a linear fit model with the NSI intertie deviation being modeled as the dependent variable. Um, I'll go through some of these and, and sort of graphical examples, but I'll say here at a high level, overall, we, sh um, you know, we sort of saw that none of these independent variables were really strongly correlated to 
actual NSI deviation using a linear fit. So um, I'll go into some more details about each of these metrics. So let's go to the next slide, please. So the first um, uh, external factor we looked at is what I call uh, proxy bilateral energy prices. Um, you know, we wanted to look at this to see whether NSI deviation could potentially be driven by or influenced by economic signals, including energy prices from the bilateral markets. So proxy prices that I refer to here, um, these are established according to each EIM BAA's um, administrative pricing methodology that are established in their open access transmission tariffs or their OATS. These proxy prices are, you know, commonly based on prevailing bilateral energy market prices. Um, usually, it's, it's common trading hubs in uh, in the West, for example, Mid Colombia or Palo Verde. Um, although some entities do use utilize uh, CAISO pricing or some other type of methodology. So this figure here is just an, an example we pulled for the Arizona BAA. Um, so we have their proxy bilateral prices across the year. Uh, plotted against uh, their actual inner tie NSI deviation. Um, here you can see the values are clustered within kind of a lower range of prices. Um, and we do see that some outliers on the far right of the uh, X axis do exist, although they're not really complemented with a significantly high magnitude of NSI deviation. Next slide, please. So we performed a very similar comparison between the deviation and prices from the FMM, the 15-minute market. So this figure here shows the comparison for uh, Pacific Core East deviations throughout 2021 against their FMM uh, ELAP prices. So similar to the previous slide, you know, we do see kind of a, a, a more spread of outliers in, in both directions in the x-axis and the y-axis although we're not really seeing um, kind of a strong correlation here as well. So, you know, that's to say that a high price in FMM doesn't mean that there was a complementary large magnitude of inner tie deviation uh, and vice versa. Next slide, please. Again, we did this comparison um, looking at net load uncertainty. Uh, so net load is the entity's growth load value minus the contributions from wind and solar and we know that variability between what's forecasted and materialized when it comes to net load can result in uncertainty between the, the real-time markets. So we looked at this comparison to investigate whether net load uncertainty could have sort of any impact or any bearing on uh, NSI deviation in any sort of meaningful way. Uh, the representative graphic here is for the CAISO, um, as you know, it has uh, the largest load footprint um, uh, amongst the samples, but uh, the entire set of the graph can be found in the appendix. Generally here, we see that the, the NSI deviation tends to reach a higher value when the load uncertainty, the net load uncertainty is close to zero, although there is kind of spread in either direction, um, and tends to approach lower values as the net load uncertainty increases along uh, both directions of the x-axis. Um, you know, based on the flatness of the blue line here, which is the, the linear fit that we've attempted to apply to the data set, um, we can see that a linear correlation really isn't too meaningful between these two data sets. Next slide, please. Again, similar to the net load uncertainty, um, you know, we'll see variability between the forecasted and the materialized output from solar resources as well. Um, and so we took that solar uncertainty compared it against inner tie deviation. Um, and here the, the representative graphic is for the CAISO BAA. Um, generally, we do, again, see kind of a broad distribution of um, data points, um, solar uncertainty clustering between um, negative 2,000 and 2,000 megawatts on the x-axis with kind of a range of inner tie deviation between those two values, although some, some outliers do exist. But, but again, that flatness of the blue line of the linear fit shows that a linear correlation really isn't too meaningful between these two data sets. And this is my last slide. Um, the, the last thing we looked at was the wind uncertainty versus NSI deviation. Um, and so we chose the, the Idaho BAA here to show as a representative metric. Um, and we can see that the deviation tends to reach sort of a max value when the wind uncertainty is uh, low, when it's around zero. 
and approaches lower values as the uncertainty increases in both the positive and the negative direction. So that's all I have for my slides, and I'll turn it back over to Brenda unless there are any questions. Thank you, Katie. We are close to time, but I enjoy this discussion and this meeting is recorded for those who aren't able to listen to it. Feel free to share that. It will be posted in about a week. Just a reminder, the discussion questions, if you have any, due May 12th. Please visit this hyperlink for any initiative updates and analysis, as well as this presentation. And if you have any questions, please redirect it to ISO Stakeholder Affairs at ISO.com, and we will make sure to provide you an answer to any questions you may have. Lastly, we have a quick recap on the stakeholder symposium happening this year, November 9th through 10th. Uh, we will be providing notices upcoming May, so if there's any updates on that, we'll be sure to share it with you. But other than that, I'll go hand it back to my event producer, Tegan, to conclude this meeting. Thank you, everyone. And that concludes today's conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect. <laughs>